the recording is has started. So welcome everybody. I'm sorry that we're starting a few minutes late. Um, my name's Nina Parrish and I'm a professor in French and Francophone studies um, at the University of Stirling in Scotland, very cold Scotland today. Um, and I'm delighted to be welcoming you to this, this, this panel, this Friday afternoon panel um, to discuss various cultural and civil society initiatives in relation to um, managing and, and yeah, dealing with um, the memories of, um, yeah, across borders, disputed territories, difficult history. Um, it's, this is part of a project, a bigger project, an EU funded project, which is called DISTERMEM. Um, and it's funded by um, the Horizon 2020 programme, and it brings together a wide range of researchers and um, activists working for different NGOs, working together to try and understand better this idea of managing competing memories of disputed territories across borders. So what we're going to do today is to discuss the role of culture and civil society initiatives in managing these memories um, and really thinking about or trying to think about the impact culture has on peace building and reconciliation processes and how that's led to different models of art based educational programs and socially engaged cultural practices on community level. So thinking about practice, how we do memory in in um, in in these contexts. So our brilliant panel today will explore the, the, the benefits and the challenges of carrying out this type of memory work, um, which engages with often difficult and contentious history in relation to different borderlands. So we've got our speakers are from Armenia, Lithuania and Poland, and they come. I'm going to I'm going to introduce each of the speakers when, and talk to you about the format of the panel and before we start our, our conversations. But they have got so much experience. They've got so much to say. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to our discussions. So the other panels so far um, this week have been in a traditional academic format with papers followed by questions. That's not how we're doing it today. We're going to be trying and having trying to have more of a discussion about these things. So I prepared some some very general questions for our speakers. I'm hoping that you, um, everyone here, will contribute to asking questions as well. So what I suggest you do and is is to post your question in the chat when you. You, when you have a, a question or to raise your hand and I'll I'll try and keep track of all of that okay Good. so is that all right yeah okay great so let me introduce our wonderful speakers today and thank you again for 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 taking the time to join us so I'm probably going to mangle names I don't speak Lithuanian Polish or Armenian so apologies for that with a, um, an English pronunciation of all these names so our first speaker is Agidijus Alexandra Vicius who's a professor of history and head of the Lithuanian Diaspora Institute of Vytautas Magnus University in Cornus, Lithuania. So he's taught in the US at Wisconsin and Illinois and has held several senior positions at his current university. Since the year 2000, he's been the director of the Lithuanian Diaspora Institutes. And after the restoration of independence of Lithuania, he started writing for intellectual and popular media and became a member of the Lithuanian Journalist Union and an author of radio and TV programmes. He's got quite a biography. He's been a visiting professor at a number of prestigious international universities um, and is, is currently one at Bologna. His research interests lie in 19th century society, cultural and diaspora history, politics of memory and Lithuanian historiography. Our second speaker, and um, they're not in this order, another speaker is um, the, the wonderful Krzysztof Szewski. Um, and I've got a very short blurb, which I'm probably doesn't do him quite justice, but he's a practitioner of ideas, a writer, a philosopher, cultural animator, theater director, and editor, and probably much, much more. He's president of the Borderland Foundation in Senyi, Poland, where I had the great ple pleasure and privilege of spending a month this summer. Um, I recommend it to all of you. 
um, a director of the Centre Borderland of Arts, Cultures and Nations, and also a visiting professor of, um, at the University of Bologna. He's a laureate of the Dan David Prize and the Princess Margaret European Award for Culture. And his latest book, which I think is probably essential reading for all of us here today, is Towards Xenopolis, Visions from the Borderland, and it was published by the University of Rochester Press earlier this year. And last but not least, from Armenia, we have Lucina Karatian. Um, Lucina is a Yerevan-based cultural anthropologist and fiction writer. So, yes, yeah, so many activities again here too. She's a researcher at the Institute of Archaeology and Ethnography at the National Academy Academy of Sciences of Armenia, excuse me, and the director of the Centre for Continuing Education at Yerevan State University. Between 2012 and 2018, Lucina headed DVV International, um, the Armenia Country Office, and that's the Institute for International Cooperation of German Adult Education Association. And I think she's going to be talking about some of her activities with that, that project today. So when in that capacity, she was responsible for the implementation of several multi-phase and multi-components um, DVV initiated Armenia-Turkey reconciliation projects, which involved oral history research and adult education. So her research, publication, practical work focuses on memory, oral history, national minorities, reconciliation and conflict resolution, social cultural impacts of policy reforms and civil society formation. She's very well qualified for this panel. And so since November 2018, Lucina represents Armenia on the Committee of Export Experts of the European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages of the Council of Europe. She's a member of PEN Armenia and a chair of its Women Writers Committee since 2021. Um, before I start with my questions, I know that I've forgotten things already about the, the project more generally. Um, we have a feedback form, um, as is often the case with this type of event. It's in the chat now. would really like to hear um, your, your thoughts on, on, on this event. So please take the time to, to, to complete this form. Any of you who've been involved in EU grants will know the importance of this sort of paperwork. So, so I encourage you to fill that in. Also, we're organising a conference between um, Lithuania, a real um, cross-border conference between Poland and Lithuania, Krasnogruda and Kornas um, in the summer. Um, and the call for papers for that conference will be available on our website in the next few days, if I've understood correctly. So keep an eye out for that. I'll hope you'll be, in, hope you'll be interested. I should have said all that at the beginning, apologies. So I've been talking far too much. I'm not gonna be talking like this the whole time. So my first question, and I'm gonna start, um, if I can start with, um, we'll, we'll go in the reverse order of who I've introduced. So if Lucina can uh, um, start with the response to this question, I just want a general question about the experiences you've had leading um, various NGOs, so it's the DVV International Experience, I think, to do with the memories of, of disputed territories. So Lucina, if you could start us with that. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Initially, basically, it started me being a member of an Armenian NGO called Tazarasha, an Armenian Center for Ethnological Studies. And then later, this NGO was um, in cooperation with DVV International and some other NGOs, uh, was involved in Armenia-Turkey reconciliation projects. And later, I became the head of DVV International in Armenia. And in this capacity, I was involved in series of Armenia-Turkey reconciliation projects from 2009 till 2016. The projects were funded by the German Foreign Office and generally aimed at building bridges between the people of Armenia and Turkey through adult education, intercultural exchange, and oral history research. They basically involved research, but also in later stages, cultural activities. And maybe I will focus more on those when speaking. But also in addition to this main experience, I will be focusing while speaking about the project per se. I have also been involved in several Armenian Azerbaijani projects involving researching on the territory of Karabakh, um, 
basically that's my experience um, and this is uh, what I will be speaking about. I will be focusing on the projects uh, implemented by DVV International and its partners. And my, my examples, most examples will come from, from those projects. And I will speak about a particular project with more information, both about the project and the context and the lessons learned when, when answering your next question. Thank you. <laughs> Lucina knows my questions. Yes, brilliant. Thank you so much. And Krzysztof, can, I, can you talk a little bit about the work of the, the, the Borderland Foundation, please, in this context? We can't hear you, Christoph. Turn on my mic. Yes. Thank you. So my main experience with memory is to work with Borderland Foundation and the center you mentioned. So we established it in 1990 in a small town, Seine, at the Polish-Lithuanian border. Uh, now we have also International Center for Dialogue in the village Krasnogruda, which is not far from Seine, almost at the border with Lithuania. Uh, but if the weather is good, like here I have, I'm in Gdańsk now, so the very beautiful weather. And I, I can see from my village, from Krasnogruda, also Russia, Kaliningrad and Belarus. Uh, so it's this geogra geographical borderland, uh, uh, different borders, a fresh one, uh, never existed uh, since the beginning of 20th century. So the question uh, was how to establish new communities, uh, new states, uh, after a completely different federational uh, heritage we had here in in the borderlands so and it costs many conflicts dramas traumas uh, because of all these wars and clashes uh, in mostly in 20th century and our work uh, was uh, you know on that way how to rebuild the connective tissue between all these cultures, languages, nations, societies, and, and memory became a, a, a very important tool for, uh, for that work. So memory can divide, but, uh, but in fact, and you, you can have your own memory, uh, but in fact, the nature of memory is to have all in common. And so uh, if it does not work, all in common, it means that there is a kind of sickness or pollution of memory. Uh, and that kind of work, how to revitalize uh, in full scope the memory uh, working in natural um, organic way, how to bring back, uh, I think it, you, you, may, uh, you may consider it as an utopian idea, probably you will never gain this perfect common memory, uh, but at least to be on the road, you know, to be on the track uh, toward that direction uh, became a main challenge for our organization, uh, which is both cultural and educational uh, one. So we do art in different fields, like films, theater, music, uh, visual arts, literature. But at the same time, we have many uh, educational programs. You may call it Academy for Bridge Builders. The bridging, you know, we consider as a craft. Uh, you can uh, have a laboratory of that uh, craft. Uh, and to teach it, to, to develop different educational prog programs around that. So we do it in a local uh, context of this borderland of Poles, Lithuanians, uh, Belarusians, uh, of rational believers, Ukrainians, uh, Roma gypsies. Uh, we still have at this borderland, but also around uh, the Danish communities like Jewish, uh, which was uh, at, at a certain time the dominant one in late 19th century. 
so we have our headquarters in a small town uh, in a Jewish quarter of, of that town. So former synagogue, former yeshiva school and former Hebrew gymnasium now works uh, as a borderland center buildings. But, uh, but we do also this work on uh, other borderlands in the world. So in, in the Balkans, in Central Eastern Europe, in Caucasus, in Indonesia, but more and more, I would say, in the West. So this workshop becomes uh, very um, actual uh, in, in, in Barcelona, in Berlin, in New York, uh, there, are, there are new borderlands, uh, especially with immigrants, but uh, but not not only. So this is also the field of our work as well. Great, thank you so much. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. And last, not not least, so Edidius, can you tell us a little bit about um, your work in this field, generally? Yeah, thank you. My name uh, would uh, better pronounce Egidius. Oh, ex uh, apologies uh, and thank you for telling me, Egidius. Or Greek origin. Egidius or Gid, but in Lithuania and in Poland, maybe it is Egidius. And uh, first uh, remark about, about our panel. Somehow I see a triangle with uh, some Scottish uh, mediator inside that. <laughs> and let, me, let me make uh, this uh, interpretation of, of this symbol, because uh, in some respect, we are very, very close with uh, Krzysztof Krzyzewski. Uh, we should say that we are old friends, partners, and both living uh, in the space. I'm usually joking. It's a uh, Republic of uh, the two borderlands. And uh, from another side, uh, Lithuania and Armenia and, uh, are uh, really post-Soviet uh, spaces uh, or, or, or countries. And in terms of uh, the civic society in that inherited uh, mentality, we are sometimes closer with Armenia than with Poland because uh, the Polish uh, social history and realities prove that there are much more potential uh, in uh, and uh, civil organizations in the Polish side. And the post-Soviet society usually could be characterized that is created some structure of PP, private and public, but very, very weak civic. In some terms, we can say that we inherited uh, some sort of uh, the perception mm -hmm. of realities around, which uh, uh, belonged uh, only to the state uh, authority. They, in the censure and in the, those uh, uh, hates of, of power, will decide what to tell about the past. They decide what we are like, and the individuals and the um, uh, volunteer associations uh, uh, mean very little in this respect. This is my inside joking about this triangle. But Scott's <laughs> role here uh, could be uh, described by the words of, uh, of Czeslav Milos, which is so important for us in the region, in, in East Central Europe in general, but both Lithuania and Polish uh, interaction. Lithuanian being the Nobel Prize winner as Polish poet. Uh, and usually, usually Milos uh, tried to intrigue, uh, saying that if you want to understand us old Lithuanians, you should learn Scottish history. <laughs> if you understand Scottish history and the destiny of the Scots inside United Kingdom, then you should uh, be able to understand uh, some uh, destiny of Lithuanian gentry inside Polish-Lithuanian commonwealths and then heritage. This is this is serious thing, but I, I made some joke from that. And uh, add to your introduction, which was so, so uh, uh, full, but uh, uh, in, at this panel, I would introduce myself a bit different. I would say that uh, Academical work, uh, research, and publications sometimes uh, uh, make uh, make very little to that direction, uh, which is a target of our, of our panel discussion. 
but I I'll, uh, I joined uh, after 1990s. Uh, I joined Open Society Fund uh, uh, Lithuania, and uh, the main target was uh, restoration of our civic abilities, open civic society, which was uh, so weak after the Soviet occupation period. And uh, being involved, I, I perceive this as the challenge. It's not to, to make some uh, general policy developing uh, uh, the skills of, of uh, the um, uh, liberal democratic uh, society, but also to do something by myself. And that was the time I, I initiated and joined maybe some 15 of civic uh, organizations around Lithuania, including some uh, we are together uh, uh, with uh, Krzysztof Czerzewski. I mean, I would mention here three practices, three organizations, three uh, volunteer associations. Uh, one would be Czeslav Milos Native Place Foundation, where we met probably first time with Krzysztof Czerzewski because he was invited to, to join the board. Another one was the Institute of the uh, Grand Duchy of Lithuania, which is really um, a society uh, which is dedicated to, to, to deepen the uh, multicultural traditions of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania for the uses of the future society, how to explore those uh, nice uh, nice features, uh, how to uh, educate uh, a new citizen with the ability to, to face multicultural heritage and to meet the other. And the third one uh, probably um, uh, I should uh, mention would be Sugihara Diplomats for Life Foundation. I, I, I am uh, one of the two founders of this. Uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, Kaunas, uh, Kaunas uh, based organization, uh, which is uh, 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 really about the memory, about the war refugees during the uh, Second World War and the efforts to save Chiyunia uh, Sugihara, Jan Zvartendik, uh, those diplomats uh, who resided in, uh, uh, in, in, in Kaunas, they were involved. Yeah, from, from this point, my practice, because if I would say that, uh, yeah, uh, Borderland Foundation, Lithuanian-Polish relations, uh, after uh, 100 years of uh, different conflicts, it's very important this direction. And uh, in the Polish side, we can say, we see the uh, civic activities and uh, the Pogranicza Foundation is the best example, like a censure of those activities. If you compare Lithuanian side, no such uh, NGOs you could uh, find uh, 30 kilometer uh, border, uh, borderland zone. No uh, organizations uh, even close to, to what Pogranicza do. Everything is concentrated in Vilnius or in Kaunas in two uh, bigger academical cities. They are concerned about, uh, about dialogue, but in the na national scale or international scale, but not the local, not the localities. And in this respect, uh, in this respect, I would, I would uh, if, it's, if I still have some time to tell the story, uh, do, we, do it, we can we can maybe move on to, I'm sure you'll have time later in the discussion to tell this story, I think. Is that okay? I, that, because uh, uh, I, I just uh, tried to, to, to introduce myself as one who is concerned not only about the research of those yes. processes, but uh, I, I, I just tried to, to perform a, a, a joiner, a, 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 a guy who is involved in those practices, even if the results are not so impressive like in the Pogranicza case. <laughs> Thank you, that's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to move on to, to, to so we talk more specifically about certain projects. 
And so the, the the next question I'd like to ask, and it's I mean it's a it's a it's a silly question in, in any in in many ways because I'm asking you about success and what is success. But you, I mean these could be reflections on on these ideas too, perhaps. But um, again, I'll start with Lucina. If you could tell us a, a, a little bit about your most successful projects working um, with these ideas. Yeah, thank you. It's just a comment before I move uh, to the project specifically. It's interesting because we are speaking about disputed territories, borders, memories, and Lithuania and Poland have a border, while Armenia is, in a sense, completely out of this context because, okay, we have a shared past with Lithuania as being a part of the same state, with Poland as being part of so-called socialist, uh, I don't know, camp or whatever. But in terms of disputed territories or disputed memories, I think we would have to think hard to find anything common to discuss. It seems from like from the historical perspective, if you look at it. Therefore, before moving to the successful project, I would like to make a broader, it just appeared to me that I would need to make this broader introduction for everybody to somehow follow what I will be speaking about. Basically, as uh, maybe many of you know, Armenia is currently, um, uh, is currently have two neighbors, um, Turkey and Azerbaijan, with one of whom it has an active conflict and with the other one it has a history uh, of genocide and, and conflict which, which prevails the discourse until now and which is also part of the ongoing conflict with Azerbaijan somehow. As, as Turkey supports Azerbaijan in this context, and as both borders from Turkey and Azerbaijan are still closed. So we are speaking about a very specific, very peculiar, I would say, situation, because in fact, Armenian-Turkish border is probably the only part of the USSR border which still remains closed after the fall of Berlin Wall. So it's a very interesting situation, having a completely closed border with one of your neighbors, um, uh, which, uh, and having, um, uh, having part of, if not most uh, uh, of your historical memory-wise and historically Armenian territory where Armenians lived, on the territory of Turkey. Mm. So basically the project I will be speaking about is, um, is about these territories. Well, it was built uh, around that memory and history. That's just an overall kind of an intro before moving to the particular project. These projects I have uh, told about uh, that I was involved while heading BBB International in Armenia, they were a series of projects. And the one I will speak about, it was the fourth one in this series. It was called Speaking to One Another, Adult Education and Oral History Contributing to Armenian-Turkish Reconciliation. And this one was implemented in 2011, uh, 2013, almost, not almost, 10 years ago. It had two distinct components. One was a local history workshop for students, which involved oral history research, photography, and performance. And the other component was a traveling exhibition that would take oral histories collected in uh, previous phases of the project to Tbilisi, Batumi, Nicosia, Berlin, and Paris. Uh, as a result of this local history workshop, the students that participated, they produced a book, which is called Mush with Mush, uh, Mapping Memories from Armenia and Turkey. And I will basically focus on this uh, particular component of the project as that is the one which, re which relates mostly to, the, to our today's topic and which I consider to be successful. I will tell why. Uh, the local history component basically was built around the study of history in a particular geographic context. 
We took for this uh, the German model of local history workshops, which were community-based volunteer organizations established in post-World War II Germany, meaning West, West Germany, not the East one. And these organizations, uh, some of them they still exist today. They aimed to create an alternative history of a place through oral history interviews, local narratives linked to a specific person, event, place, or building, uh, which would be supplemented by archival research. So we have taken this German approach to the complicated Armenian Turkish context in which there is almost no joint historical research, either by professionals or the public. However, since the context of the Armenian Turkish past is connected by the memory of genocide, a subject that is now over a century old, we were able to use this local, uh, this local history tools and methods, such as oral history interviews, family archives, and photography, to deconstruct and reconstruct the past and address how it had been constructed differently in two places. For that purpose, the project team chose a specific area in Turkey, which was a part of the Armenians' homeland, where they lived for centuries until the genocide. So this is exactly what Armenians call Western Armenia, and Turkey calls Eastern Turkey, or you will also uh, have it as Eastern Anatolia. This was the city of Mush with its surrounding villages located in uh, southeast of modern Turkey. And we decided to make a call and have students interested in the project and got 10 participants from Turkey, 10 participants from Armenia and organized a first student camp in Mush. The purpose of, a, of the camp was to train these 20 selected students from both countries in three different workshops, oral history, local history, photography, and performance. After the training, the students would go out into the city of Mush and surrounding villages, and they would interview people, take photos, and find out interesting stories and narratives for a performance. They would hence create an alternative history of the place through people's personal narratives and photos. The next stop of the project, uh, this first phase happened in 2012. So we speak about the uh, autumn of 2012. And in next year, in spring of 2013, the same group came to Armenia. And the students did a similar work in the villages populated by people genocide originally from Mush, whose ancestors have somehow managed to survive the genocide and brought their memories about the place with them to Armenia. So the local history of Mush would be reconstructed through personal narratives from both sides of the border. Basically, like there is this place Mush, and we try to construct this history, to reconstruct it through the memories and narratives and photos uh, from Armenia and Turkey. I believe the project was successful because we approached the place not as just a geographical location, but as a discourse. While we had included a brief fact sheet on the history of Mush in the final product, the book, which focused on the area's cultural significance for Armenians and some statistics from the beginning of the 20th century, we did not intend to present the local history of Mush as just a set of facts, a definite truth about the place or events that happened in that place. In sense, we treated Mush as a discourse. We did not simply present its history. We presented the place as it was remembered, imagined and narrated in Turkey and in Armenia. We did not want to define, describe or, or locate Mush politically, administratively or historically. We did map Mush, but not as politicians or official historiographers would do. We mapped it through people's narratives and our group experience in this place. While current political maps with their defined borders interfere with this discourse, we believed that they do not dominate mental maps of people. So this was basically the philosophy behind. And to say what, what this we mean, basically we had students from both Armenia and Turkey, 
who worked in groups while in Mush, they, one of the groups, the oral history group, collected narratives and memories and stories related to the place from the people living in Mush now. And in Armenia, that same group collected similar stories, uh, uh, their memories, <coughs> histories, and so on, from Armenians originally from Mush. They have their grandparents' memories and stories and uh, things brought from Mush. And uh, then the same with photography group, they took photos in Mush that would tell about the place and they did the same in Armenia. And with performance, it was like based, structured around the theater of oppressed approach, but a bit uh, like it, it was of course changed and, uh, and uh, uh, kind of adopted to our situation. They would go to the field, would still collect these stories, and then they would create a script to perform, to tell the story of Mush from both sides. As a central piece, we had a map, uh, which would map the places we have visited and the places we had collected stories about. And in the book, which is a final product, this map is a central piece, which basically brings together memories about the place. Uh, and each location on this map would also have its narrative, its story in oral history essays, in photography essays, or in the performance. The other interesting thing is that we connected um, students from Armenia and Turkey. For example, a couple, one from Armenia, one from Turkey, would work on a joint essay based on oral history interview conducted, interviews conducted, which meant they would have to negotiate many things before this would become a written text. And it meant that all the terms we use, for example, even starting with Western Armenia, we have a glossary at the end, and we agreed how we define Western Armenia in that glossary as a group, or Armenian Highland, or, or any term which is about, which, which has this um, baggage and legacy of the past. So we agreed on every term, every word that, that we as a group were going to join. Uh, to, to sorry, we're going to use. And every couple working on a specific part or every group, for example, performance, they had their internal negotiation to agree on things. At the end, you will see some braver texts which go farther and use, for example, genocide as their own text. Some other texts where you wouldn't see the term genocide being used by the authors themselves, but you would see it used while quoting an Armenian uh, interviewee. So every time there was this internal negotiation and agreeing on terms. So, and the success for me was this process of really trying to agree on a common language between the group and really uh, taking uh, memories and discourses seriously and approaching the place not as politicians would do with their languages and imposing terms, but with whatever they were able to gather from the field and whatever they were able to discuss among themselves. We had many clashes throughout this process. It was painful. Uh, we had some incidents when we would have reflection sessions for five hours. But at the end, I think whoever survived the process, uh, all of them, all of uh, are, are really good friends and are keeping in touch until now. And probably this was the only experience uh, which basically uh, took uh, a place and tried to narrate it differently based on this experience that they have they have gone together because the research was done jointly and then the analysis was done jointly and then the texts were produced jointly so therefore i really success it uh, i consider it success even though in terms of numbers like how many people we reached out i wouldn't say well the books reached out many they are still very popular many read them many many uh, still contact us with questions and so on but in terms of these internal processes that were life changing it was a small group who really was the part of the process from the beginning till the end thank you thank you thank you that's absolutely fascinating and i can yeah there's going to be 
thoughts they think about the local aspect which is so important and yeah. also working with young people as well so Christoph, can I ask you and I I sense that asking a, um, a philosopher about what is the most successful project is is maybe a, a <laughs> an impossible question to answer but I know yeah there's there's lots of examples from the Borderland Foundation that you could draw on I'm sure We can you unmute Christoph, please. First, uh, to say about uh, this open and close borders, uh, 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 Luz was uh, telling about how the situation is changing rapidly now. Uh, we we of course have open border with Lithuania, but the Polish-Russian border is close, and Polish uh, Poland polish pilar russian border. You know, we first had, you know, these barbed wire entanglements, but now we have a wall, a real new wall on the polish Belarusian border, mostly because of immigrants um, from, from uh, Syria, Pakistan, you know, Middle East and, and so on. So uh, that's a dynamic of borderland situation. Uh, but to answer your question about practices, in short, I would say, you know, that the uh, first, uh, the, the general picture of how memory is located in our practices, I would underline three, uh, uh, three ways and um, try to present a project which is like a response to each of the way, each of the paths. So we work on the common memory, we work on critical memory, and we work on good memory. And uh, that's, of course, there are other aspects of, of the memory culture uh, in our practices, but these three are very specific, I, I would say, uh, to um, about our uh, borderland uh, philosophy. Uh, so first, Mm, the question is uh, how to um, to try to rebuild common memory, which was so cut into the pieces, you know, this destroyed during last century, mostly uh, uh, each, uh, you know, when we came to this small town, each community had its own ghetto or its own uh, word, you, you know, culture houses, newspapers, schools, memories along that, everything was separated. There was no common space, no way to communicate as a whole community and also with these vanished communities as well. So the challenge was how to create a common space and uh, as I mentioned to you, we uh, we renovated the, the old synagogue. We called it White Synagogue. And one of the first gesture in action we did was to invite people uh, to the synagogue to create a, the circle um, of um, storytelling, sharing memories of this uh, dramatic uh, century and sharing songs. Uh, and uh, so on. So, but it was like a theater, our background is theater, avant-garde theater. So the main thing was to create, to have um, this courage to invite people to the common circle, not to go to each community and only hear or register the stories, but to convince them that they can come and possess this common space of the former synagogue. So you, you have suddenly, you, you had a great circle. We call this the Pieśni Starowieków, the songs of ancient times, uh, uh, metaphorically, but, uh, but it was for the first time uh, after many, many years or for many of the participants was the first time in life to have an opportunity to sit in one circle to to share stories not with your own community you know with, with your own family with your own church but with others yes with the uh, with neighbors um, uh, which um, were sometimes in conflict with us or had different memories about the same historical events as, as you know. So 
that that night, you know, because it was many hours of um, of being present in one space with many tears, you know, emotional lamentations and storytellings, uh, became like a ground uh, for our working. Uh, in fact, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that we, you know, that was in the way that. Uh, that we agreed upon, you know, one uh, one uh, common history. Yeah, there were different points of view to the same events, uh, but the main thing was to be present, not to reject invitation, not to reject the room around the circle. Okay, I'm here, and because I'm here, I accepted that although my memory goes differently or my uh, um, my feelings are, uh, you know, to remember some traumatic uh, things from the past, from my neighbors, but uh, I should break down my prejudices and my fear not to come and not to be present. So it was uh, very important. And the second thing was that young generation children just uh, work with us, you know, uh, Deli delivering candle, candle lights, you know, from one group of the people to another, and we immediately discovered that uh, that these stories goes not to us mainly, or not, uh, but mainly to these grandchildren. You know, never hearing these stories before, there was now this generational transmission. Uh, uh, after communist time, the past was like taboo, not to talk about that, better not to share these uh, things from the past with our young uh, people, better for the future, maybe. So it was the first time that, that they suddenly discovered that there is a way of sharing, there is a, a space, a ritual, you know, something that we can share it with, with our you know, children and uh, grandchildren. So, and uh, uh, after that moment, uh, that ritual, we, you know, there was a, sh a way to create a performance, which we still have, uh, which is called Saint Chronicles, as a performance which tried to collect all these stories in the theater form to have a common story for the whole town. Yes, giving voices to each community, to each culture, each language, and uh, and have it in a in an artistic form of of a theater performance, but what what is the most successful uh, thing uh, around that is imagine we started we so the performance came out like 1994 yes so it could happen you know the book came out uh, around that uh, about Sane chronicles and and so on but still uh, today we have 2022 and still we perform this theater piece it is like transmission from one generation to another that so it was not just like one time event for the community but it is like a permanent story building you know, with new generations, with new people all the time as a continuation, uh, uh, which, which is uh, the crucial thing for our practices, to find this river of continui continuity. You know, you do something even successful, as you are saying, but okay, but the question is what tomorrow and what after one year? after five years, after 10 years, we are here. Yes, that's the decision we, we did in 1990s, that we are, as a theater group, as a artists, educators, we are staying and living with people. Uh, that was the most revolutionary thing. Usually you just go, you make research, for one year you have a grant, you know, you, you, you do the performance, come with the theater, but very soon you are just, going further on, you know, uh, to other places and mostly to the festivals or to the conferences. But uh, but to break it down uh, uh, meant for us, okay, but we should stay and continue and be with them. So it was like the building the common memory means time. Yes, you should somehow regain time for culture, which we lost. You know, it's everything event-oriented, project-oriented, you know, short time. Uh, and so on. So it it is not enough 
uh, to have successful common mem memory building, you know, uh, somehow. The second thing is about critical memory. So that what it means in short that you, you as a subject, uh, obliged somehow not only to understand uh, others, to give them the floor, to give them the voice, but also to become more self-critical uh, towards your own history, your own memories, uh, and so on, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to do kind of a work on your own guilt, on your own uh, weaknesses uh, in the past, you know, somehow to counter this production of memory to apologize our own suffering, to apologize our own uh, tragedies and so on, which is natural, of course, especially we, uh, when it is overwhelmed by a big tragedy like genocide, you know, uh, uh, which is so crucial for Armenian memory. But uh, uh, sooner or later, the question is, can we uh, build a kind of uh, critical reflection to that? Yes, uh, to, to, to build a kind of distance to, to that uh, position, because otherwise it could, this overwhelming power of memory could, uh, uh, could work against, um, against us. So we have to, to give you an example, we have, the publishing house from the very beginning. So we publish books, uh, magazines, uh, and it was, I think, 2000, the year 2000, when we publish the book by Professor Jan Tomasz Gross, Neighbors, about Polish-Jewish relationships during the Holocaust, but uh, about this, not far from Sejny town, Jedwabne, were of course under German occupation, but it happened that Polish neighbors murdered the Jewish uh, Jewish uh, neighbors. And this uh, story, this narrative uh, about Yedwabne was uh, uh, was revolutionary for our consciousness, Polish consciousness. You know, we were always treated ourselves uh, as victims of hi history. You know, we were. Uh, we were experiencing suffering, you know, from occupiers, from big powers, from the West and East, but never considered ourselves as also perpetrators. And it happens in his history in different moments. So th this book was like an earthquake in whole country, you know, but not only uh, interna uh, internationally uh, as well. Uh, people were asking us if you are building the bridges while you are opening the wounds, you know, maybe better to omit it, you know, to forget about that, to concentrate on positive things uh, and so on. But uh, for our work with memory, we understood that you will no, do not have legitimacy to work with others on memory if you do not work critically or you know, on your own. Yeah, that, that to open up the floor for building something together with others, you should do this critical work on your side, not expected that some somebody uh, some somebody else will do it. So it's still uh, uh, it's still uh, the discussed memory in Poland. You know there are uh, the Jedwabne case, but there are many other examples. You know from. Uh, it just opened the door for uh, for um, uh, research, for reflection on, on how it was and what was the position of Polish people during this dark night of of uh, Holocaust. So we did this, uh, uh, you know, with book publishing. And the third uh, example of how to uh, work with the most difficult in my mind. Uh, <laughs> Um, field in the memories to, to work on the good memory. Why most difficult? Because uh, uh, this is something uh, very uh, difficult to express, you know, that something is, uh, is in, in your heart, you know, from the past, from your coexistence with uh, the others. 
uh, some good things, some good memories, good gestures during the war, during the conflict, during the, the life, you know, daily life. But there is no language to express it. There is no ceremonies, uh, rituals uh, um, to express it. You know, the, we have ceremonies. Uh, on uh, to express our painful memories, you know, our um, apology um, uh, uh, with uh, with ourselves. Yes, with monuments, with museums, with uh, um, calendar uh, day, important dates, and so on. But uh, but if something is at the bottom, you know, uh, like a good memory toward my, uh, my ne uh, neighbor. You know, for example, you know, the most uh, direct example I have is people who survive, to, who help to survive Jews in Seine or other uh, small communities in Poland. Yes, they, they somehow they should hide it uh, because there was no way to talk about that. You know, they were somehow ashamed that this help to survive, you know, among the Christian communities, you know, they help to um, uh, others to survive. And there was something like a shameful or dangerous story for them. You're not better not to talk about that. So uh, how to work is that you should be, you know, respected or proud of that. Yes, that, that you did it during the war time. Yes. Um, when we were in the Balkans, you know, after, uh, you, you know, in Mostar, for example, uh, I remember the time when our young people from Sejny, Lithuanians, Poles came there and started to ask Muslims and uh, Croats, you know, did you help each other during the war? There was the first question like that they heard you know, from the outsiders. Yes, it was much easier than to raise this question. So this is, of course they helped, but this is not the, the way you became a hero uh, after the war. You know, you just uh, uh, try uh, again, not to talk about that. So uh, how to create a program, a ritual, a artistic form for us, it was a, something what we call mystery of the bridge. We have it once uh, once a year, August 22nd, when we uh, encourage people to build with us a performance, which is based on these scenarios that of course, there, there are situations that broken our bridges, you know, conflicts, you know, disconnections, problems and tragedies, but what, how we can rebuild it, you know? Do you remember something would help, help us to put the bridge again as working, as something that connects us? So then you somehow uh, open the floor for good memories, you know, good, uh, you create a good language, uh, find, try to find um, uh, something in music, in theater, you know, the, the most, artistic sophisticated things because this is most difficult not to make pitchy uh, uh, things around that yes that you you find the way to express in most legitimate uh, legitimate way the good memory yes that uh, which is so difficult on on daily uh, the daily basis so we have one day in the calendar uh, of the borderland calendar, which is not celebrating our own independent day, you know, suffering day, uh, national day, religious day, but which is celebrating the common memory, you know, the common good memory, yes, the breach, which is not in possession of anybody, you know, it's uh, it's open to, uh, to, uh, to everybody. So the day which belongs to, <laughs> all citizens of the borderlands. There is no owner of this day, like Lithuanian Independence Day or Chris, uh, Christmas or, you know, other things. And you finally have this opportunity to, uh, to build an artistic form, artistic pe performance for, for good memories as well, to rebuild the bridge, uh, in fact. Thank you, Christoph. You, there's a there's a lot of material there, but it's yeah, the work that you do at the foundation is just so so admirable. It it, it is extraordinary. Um, we'll come back to lots of those, I hope. But um, over to Igida just to to talk a little bit about the work that he he's done in in Lithuania and some successful um, projects there. Can you unmute, please?
Now, do you hear me? Yes, yes, we do. Yes. I did nothing. Somebody turned me off. <laughs> Probably the moment I tried to say that it's not so easy to tell about success, when you are teaching and thinking, what is your success? Yeah. So, the universe and after. Or if you publish a book and then what does it mean success? Number of copies in the different markets or some uh, uh, references or some uh, some translations, whatever. I, that's why it's not not so so easy to tell about success. It's uh, much more uh, easy to, to tell what the plan was, what was done and then yeah, we hope that the effect uh, in the souls of the people around is uh, substantial and positive and whatever. Because uh, it's simple uh, to, to say that uh, lecturing or doing different workshops with different groups of people, starting from the students and uh, then civil civic activists, uh, it would be one field. And uh, uh, some... some uh, uh, TV or 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 or, or, or oh, do you hear me? I, yes. I, yeah, we can hear you and see you. Okay, I need just to add some energy to my iPhone. Yeah, uh, this is. Uh, is it okay? Do you hear still? Yes, we do, and we definitely don't want to lose you. Yeah, so definitely the, get it another, plugged in. <laughs> another complication is to distinct something. What was done? Uh, in in inside the uh, um, uh, volunteer associations because working as at the university usually you are involved in many fields of action and uh, uh, differently from uh, from krasnogruda from uh, from sane uh, side we can say that our activities were mostly concentrated in the university cities but not uh, straight on the on the local um, community area. Uh, if we compare the borderlands, uh, both Lithuanian and Polish, Lithuanian side somehow reflects a little bit of vanished communities. I say people were during the Soviet occupation time deported, people were uh, somehow uh, 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 forcefully collectivized, Jewish society was exterminated, Polish minority in that area just uh, took some uh, uh, repatriation uh, refuge to the other side of the border. Because the Soviets, uh, after the Second World War, created so big danger for the Lithuanian society that uh, even Lithuanians uh, uh, sometimes took refuge to the other side of the border. And now we have a situation here locally that in the Polish side, there are still some uh, variety of minorities, but mainly Lithuanian uh, and Polish majority. In Lithuanian side, we have no minorities at all. Just, uh, just uh, those uh, local Lithuanians with very simplified uh, forms of memory they do not understand. They don't understand really the complex and historical way of that distinction, because the border was put on the map and divided the, the area only one hundred years ago. During the centuries, it was uh, some uh, western outskirt of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, and uh, after the second, uh, after the First World War. Uh, po Polonia Restituta and the Lithuanian Republic just got the conflict and, the, and the separated those territories and the, the borders are in the place like that. But the, again, differently from Armenian examples, uh, I would uh, say with the great pleasure that uh, Schengen and the European Union and the nature now really destroyed the border. There is no physical border at all. We don't see at least many of, of, of those border guards or, or something like that. Lithuanians in, in, in thousands are, are attacking Polish, Polish side and Sene, Bedronka, supermarket, buying a little bit cheaper, uh, cheaper goods and, and gasoline, whatever. And it's massively, 
massively. Sometimes, sometimes this effect, which was not organized, no NGO was uh, was involved in that. But uh, but the effect, uh, you know, the wave of those changes was substantial. What what we did really, we acted mostly on the national scale. National scale, I mean, like uh, the Institute of uh, 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 the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, which which was organized specifically to develop some uh, narrative, some sort of alternative narrative to the nationalist agenda of of, of uh, uh, vast uh, vast. Uh, layers of Lithuanian society, telling, telling the story of the multicultural society. Then Dutch of Lithuania as the nation state with some uh, signs uh, of a rule of law in, and the union with Polish kingdom survived during the centuries. And a lot of, uh, of uh, those civic uh, values and civic uh, um, civic uh, characteristics are still functional if we would pay enough attention to that or educate, express uh, about that. And uh, it makes uh, more deep understanding of uh, the interchanged uh, Polish-Lithuanian identity. Sometimes organizing the event, uh, the other side of the small country uh, as Lithuania. I remember one event organized by the Institute of uh, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania in Telshi, uh, other side of Lithuania, but it's just 300 kilometers across the country. It's 10 times smaller than Poland. And it touched a very important and attractive and controversial historical fact. The first president of, uh, elected president of the uh, Republic of Poland was Gabriel Narutovich, Samogitian or Lithuanian gentleman born in uh, 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 the, near Telshi. And his brother was the uh, active Lithuanian uh, 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 guy in 1918, and he was the, the uh, he signed the Declaration of Lithuanian Independence. One brother this side, another one the Polish side. And then organizing the event uh, conference for uh, uh, history teachers, for some intelligentsia in, in the place. And uh, it, I, I think it was a, a really good success when you saw that uh, uh, our action somehow stressed uh, very much simplified narration, which is in our textbook in our school textbook. Uh, like the Institute was always some, uh, some trickster of those simplified nationalist uh, propaganda cliches, exposing examples from the complicated, complex uh, um, uh, um, pieces of, of our history. And uh, again, some, some Belarusian case. Institute was uh, always uh, involved in uh, organizing uh, Belarusians around the world, uh, looking um, uh, for uh, some, uh, some uh, identity cases, uh, looking for some opportunities to exchange the opinions. And you know, Lithuania is now in, again in a very strange uh, 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 corridor mm -hmm. between, uh, between uh, uh, Belarus with the, the more more uh, solid border and uh, Kaliningrad Oblast, mm. and uh, imagine that that uh, those two borders are getting more and more thick. Mm. And again, uh, what I I would add to to this, it 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 was uh, not related with the uh, the NGO I uh, would be involved involved, but. Uh, uh, today, morning session in Mariampole, uh, 30 kilometers from the border with Poland, uh, was a, a conference organized by NGO, Society of Christianas Donelaitis. Christianas Donelaitis, famous classical poet uh, of uh, 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 Lithuanian poet, but 
Baku lived the, uh, the um, uh, second half of the 18th century in, uh, in Prussia, in East Prussia, because that territory was inhabited by Lithuanian population, but the citizen of, uh, of uh, the uh, kingdom of Prussia. And Donelaitis became symbolically important uh, 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 personage in, in, in Lithuanian narration. What was my provocation uh, as the uh, presenter during this conference uh, today, th this morning? My, my, my uh, question uh, was for debate, what mental obstacles are, uh, 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 prevent us to understand deeper Christianus Donelaitis? And I said, think that we are picking all the Lithuanian signs from that uh, uh, multicultural history and almost forgot about German uh, domination and we forgot about German culture. But think that German minority lived in those Lithuanian borderlands up to the Second World War and only after they were or repatriated or deported or executed, whatever, that we need uh, to, to restore our memory using also uh, the, the, the colorful facts of, of, of the past of those vanished communities. For Lithuanians in the border, uh, borderland space, vanished communities are Jewish, Polish, and German. Mm -hmm. Jew, Jewish, it's, it's uh, you know, for Lithuanian, uh, the Lithuanian participation in the uh, Holocaust and this drama and the shame and guilt and all that stuff is well known. Uh, there are some national efforts, governmental efforts or whatever of, 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 uh, of that uh, 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 restoration of memory, those if we compare uh, efforts of, of uh, Pogranica publishing Jan Gross, uh, The Neighbors, and starting telling uh, the Poles about other side of the, of the history, that Lithuanians are much uh, uh, deeper in that, because they were much more involved in those atrocities. And then during at least 40 years, historiography, uh, international and now, thanks God, local historiography already started massively exposing what happened. And I would say that Lithuanians changed. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, now they are much, much, uh, uh, much more uh, feeling responsibility and then some pity of what happened. That's very important to, to, to have some, some sense of empathy, ability to listen other sometimes different and opposing stories, not always just picking the pleasant, uh, pleasant uh, opportunities to tell about heroic or martyrology or whatever, blame the Russians all the time and then forget about own uh, sins and then so something like that. This is, this is uh, how, how it, uh, it, it uh, was, uh, was directed, but uh, when you speak about those abstractions, lectures, uh, storytelling, this uh, tricking, uh, tricking uh, workshops or conferences, you never know the, how, how big is the success. Mm. <laughs> it, we, will, we will know sometimes later, it will take some time. But, but uh, at least for me, uh, the, the, uh, the, the moderate uh, outcome is that even after some uh, uh, 15 years of very conscious efforts to look for some uh, initiatives for NGO on the borderland in Lithuanian side, I, I, I always repeat to Krzysztof Czeszewski how jealous I am watching what <laughs> they do on the border. And again, I repeat, there was no success in, in organizing anything like, like that on the uh, Lithuanian-Polish border. And that the uh, civic uh, initiatives and volunteer uh, potential was uh, accumulated mostly in the big university cities, somehow taking responsibility for everything, uh, what, what's going on on, on, on those outskirts. Uh, but but uh, up to now, 
I still have some some dream that we need to do something to 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 uh, empower local community, local uh, ed educators, local teachers, or, or 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 writers, or or free citizen to do something straight in 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 their community, and uh, maybe. It is like sort uh, um, of proof about the differences of the uh, people's democracies during the socialist time in Poland and Soviet regime in the occupied Lithuania. It's still some heritage, some, some uh, uh, difference in the social structure and the uh, civic mentality. And we need to go further. We need to, to, to think about new, net, new generation uh, of, of those who are potentially the members of nation of joiners in the Tocquevillian uh, perception of, 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 of the world. Well, that's fascinating. Um, thank you so much. Um, fascinating, yeah, thinking about this, you're calling it a restoration of multicultural memories, histories, past, yeah, um, um, and the, yeah, the importance of communities, the local, it's absolutely fascinating. I am aware that time is flying past and um, I'm very happy to keep going with my questions. Those who know me know that I'm very, I always have a lot of questions, <laughs> um, but I'm very happy for others to, to ask questions too. So I'm quite happy to keep going with mine, but if you want to put, ask a question, put your hands up, um, put a question in the chat. I'm keeping an eye on it. If not, I will, I'll keep going because I've got more. <laughs> and I think that my questions are going to be questioned again, no doubt as well. Because the next one that I want to ask is about is about failure, basically, the, the things that didn't work. Um, and I suppose, yeah, we, we've talked about success and the limitations of that in terms of measuring it. What does it mean? Longevity is also obviously important. But I think often the most interesting lessons are learned when we when we fail. So I'm just going to put that out there and ask Lucina about about failure, things that maybe we, we don't normally talk about in this context. I think uh, we have already touched upon some of those, particularly with these most recent developments and how all these borders keep, uh, I don't know, changing or their conditions keep changing and so on. Um, so our first failure, I mean, major failure, I would say, was in 2015, when we were planning uh, another, a, a new project, which was basically, we were going to have a new group of students who would go together on this road speak to trace the genocide routes in Turkey and in Armenia, and they would eventually jointly produce a road map while, while being in different places and tracing how people escaped genocide from Istanbul to Armenia. So while we were planning political situation in Turkey changed and uh, it became impossible to do the Turkish part of the journey. Uh, and we had to, we ended up with the Armenian part only. I consider this being a failure, not just technically because we were not able to do a major part of the project, but basically as you go on with grassroots from bottom up initiatives to kind of work with this delicate memory issue, which is one of the most sensitive issues that keeps shaping whatever societies we have now. The, I would say up, to bottom or uh, like uh, the, the situation politically changes faster. And as it evolves, as it changes, any initiatives that come from civil society, they can be really threatened. So uh, this was a failure and a lesson learned. Unless we as civil societies get to the point when our politics is changed, when people who make decisions look at it differently, we cannot really uh, hope for um, major changes. And this is what we see now as the world is changing rapidly. It is already not the same. And all countries that are presented here are more or less affected like 
Poland is so much affected with the uh, war in Ukraine. Lithuania is affected. And we have already, I mean, you have already touched upon the Belarusian border uh, and other things like that. But this was something we have experienced back in 2016, 15, when we were doing this project. So I would say that the challenge which could end uh, with the project being failed is that as you work with these delicate and sensitive issues, you try to understand memory, you try to map it, you try to find a common language, that language and everything changes politically. And you cannot really be as fast as political processes are. Uh, that this is a major challenge for all the practitioners, I think. Okay, you can do research, you can study, but you can't really um, be as fast as, as politics shifts. Um, and that, that was a failure experience I would like to share. And I think it has to do with the processes being, uh, being uh, well, they are not all, well, usually there is no process that fully is under your control. But mm -hmm. in such themes and topics, it's even more than that. It's uh, geopolitically, politically uh, um, so complicated that you need to always take these things into account. Thank you, Lucina. Christoph, if I could ask you the, the same question, please. Yes, I, I think Luz uh, told a lot about our common uh, situation as NGOs and civic initiatives facing the policy of governments, facing you know the global policies. We all feel that we are not the mainstream, <laughs> either it is European Union or not mentioning you know uh, our authoritarian governments, you know, not mentioning something what's going on in uh, in Ukraine uh, today. So uh, you can feel a lot of frustrations, you know, as, as bridge build, uh, builder, uh, understanding that, you know, maybe all these efforts are in vain uh, facing the, the, the global powers and, and usually um, status quo and uh, but frankly saying I'm against this determinism that it is always like it was and that you we could not do any change I think one of the problems uh, we uh, we have is that we may feel this um, uh, uh, not uh, efficient uh, um, role, uh, you know, in the global perspective, you know, that uh, you you can feel that, okay, uh, um, this is a small number of the people you involve, you know, there is um, something in, uh, uh, in, in the corner of the world you're trying to uh, successfully do um, these things, but comparing with these global uh, problems, it, uh, it doesn't matter so, uh, so much. I think that this point of view is danger uh, because that's what these big powers want to think about. Uh, uh, want to uh, want us to think or to feel, you know, that they um, feel powerful when we uh, underline our effectiveness of small numbers. That's my concept is in contrary, you know, not to apply and not to pretend to to work with big numbers, uh, with big centers, with mainstreams. I don't think it can change the world. Uh, all possible changes in the world came from small numbers, from small initiatives, from small circles of the world, because it's most powerful uh, acts. Uh, so my, the only risk and only fear I have is that we will lost the belief in these small steps and small acts of doing things. 
My concept is, you know, about small centers of the world, which can uh, change the, the global situation that we will decentralize uh, the world in terms that, you know, we will invest more and more in, um, in building capacity of small communities, small regions, um, small districts of met metropolis, because it is not about the provinces only, you know, small towns, but it's also about the districts of metropolis. Uh, my feeling working, you know, in Barcelona or New York, I have the feeling that, the way to survive, you know, the the human way of living there is to care about neighborhoods, you know, the, to care about building centers in small districts um, and yeah, and to rebuild, you know, human relationships uh, 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 around the neighborhoods uh, um, in big cities as well. So this is the the main struggle uh, I, I believe and uh, this is you may say okay as i told before it is utopian but uh, uh, but i see some positive you know it's strange nina sorry for your question about the failures i trying <laughs> to to find some good, uh, good good aspects of that or positive things but it's so so easy to say okay we we have a lot of failures you know and and it's so easy to say okay look what's going on in ukraine or in birma you know myanmar and uh, as when so doesn't matter what, what you do here on there i think it would be the failure you know if you do not believe if you say it doesn't matter you know what well, uh, so to counter it is really to give more power to such small community uh, activities, small organizations, small, it could be only civic. You know, civic is toward the small, yes, to, to respect uh, the small uh, things rather than to apply or to pretend for a big one. So to, to defend civic, you, you should believe in, in uh, uh, and you should act, you should have faithfulness, you know, to act in small, numbers and maybe that's the main front line uh, in the world now i i see it in the culture field you know that uh, you know it's so even media oriented that they want to devaluate you know uh, everything what is not in the mainstream you know you you, you lose the market you know you um, it's so easy to marginalize you because of these, these things but Mm, and that would be the failure, yes. But you've mentioned, you know, uh, Prince Margaret uh, Award in Amsterdam. You know, from we we were competing with uh, I don't know huge museums uh, in Europe. You know, huge cultural institutions. Why suddenly this small uh, borderland center in Seine? You know, in this big. Um, you know, National Theatre in Amsterdam, what happened? People were asking, you know, and uh, that was our answer together with people who awarded us, you know, that there, there is, you know, this gesture to value the small, uh, you, you know, with, uh, you know, in face of Rake's Museum, for example, they have thousand times bigger, <laughs> bigger budget than we, yes, but, uh, 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 but it matters, you know, what you do in saying it matters for people in Amsterdam, in Barcelona, in, uh, in uh, uh, elsewhere, that it is, you know, this kind of a con um, constellation of relationships, corporations, activities, like with you also with Bath University, that we, we can make this change, you know, that we can, uh, it is in our hands to, to rebuild hierarchy of values, you know, to make a revolutionary uh, gestures in the ways we, um, we value the world, you know, that that's, the, I, I think, an important battle. And of course, many failures on the way. Yes, I, I'm always confronted with this situation. Recently, journalists came to, uh, to our center and they said, listen, but we are in, you know, with private money here. Uh, and because we have interest to your work, but 
our uh, magazines, our you know centers of our media didn't is, uh, covered our trip and our work. And the 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 there were two responses because you you may consider okay it's our failure. You know they were from main Polish media. You know which for many years were. Uh, writing articles, making TV reportage and everything about the work. And suddenly they are say, saying we, we do not receive money support for coming to you. And there are two reasons why. First was that we are not on the political uh, agenda, you know, of the government and, you know, public money in our country. But the even more danger, I would say, was that you are too small. Mm. Yeah, to, to have our interest, yes, of our directors, of our media, because, you, you know, the, what, what is the reason to, to write or to, um, uh, to connect uh, our uh, work with, you know, such small uh, in, in initiatives. So you may say it is a failure, but but then you, 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 you just understand the situation and say, OK, what would be our response to that? Yes, that how, uh, how and that's why it is so, uh, it's another uh, benefit uh, when you work with local community, with just people, uh, that they understand it. You know, they have this different uh, way of, of hierarchy. You know, they, they don't go necessarily along, you know, big media narratives, you know, that they, you, you can change this with, uh, with support of local people, of your partners, you know, of, of another people, uh, of small organizations from another country and, uh, and so on. So this is, um, uh, so it, it is a failure, but at the same time, this is a response, the way you find the way go uh, uh, the way out of this crisis uh, out of this uh, failure that you uh, you feel that you are in the position of uh, changing also something uh, on uh, on that uh, way and you have people on your board yes you have supporters uh, you have uh, people uh, who understand it and this is uh, um, this is a new uh, the situation, the new change, I would say in positive way, that we feel more and more such kind of support, you know, that people want to re uh, revalue, you know, to deconstruct the, the hierarchies. Uh, they, they have enough of these big numbers, narratives from big centers and find the way. So all what, what we spoke about local activities, you know, is also important in my mind of countering this terrible um, tendency in in our world to to follow only big narratives, you know, from big centers, which becoming more and more authoritarian, more and more, uh, you know, neglecting everything what is smaller and and uh, and different and the other. Yes, so uh, you you have we had at the beginning the other as minority groups, you know, national minorities, but now we have the other as small number. Which is a completely new category, which you try to defend, you know, or fight for a small number, respect the for, uh, you know, value in it, and, and it it can be at the university, it can be in London, it can be in small town Saini, the same struggle, the same battle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Krzysztof. Um, Thank you for turning my question on its head. <laughs> and yeah, the, the, um, some really, really interesting um, reflections. And I think very revealing about, yeah, how powerful the work that you do is too. That yeah, I think for me, that is the interest of failure, the, thinking about how you overcome it, how you counter it, how you, yeah. So yeah, thank you. Um, Agidijit, could you, could you, a few words on, on failure maybe? Yeah. Uh, few, because uh, because uh, uh, the answer would require uh, uh, hours of confession. Maybe <laughs> failures are the 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 salt of our life. But uh, but I'll be short. Uh, first of all, because I already started uh, about the failure, uh, and uh, uh, secondly, because uh, because. Uh, uh, Krzysztof told a lot of things I would sign 
uh, supporting, uh, supporting, and uh, many occasions to to prove that. One of those occasions uh, was uh, our uh, uh, Lithuanian side effort to uh, translate and publish a book of Krzysztof Czyżewski, Małe Centrum Świata, uh, those small centers of the world. And uh, use that uh, occasion, use that publication to, to travel all around Lithuania and introducing this book uh, with the author and sometimes without the author, but just the saying, see, that's the way uh, we, we uh, need to try to live. And uh, uh, according to, to this, uh, um, uh, my biggest, uh, biggest failure is uh, uh, the feeling or feeling of failure that we achieved so um, little organizing those local uh, local communities closer to the borders and uh, empowering them to believe they and their own memory is much more important than the centralized uh, textbook narrative. Mm -hmm. which is uh, so generalized, so, so inframed in the uh, uh, simple uh, nationalist sometimes or political uh, correct uh, na narration. That, that, that uh, for me, the, uh, the efforts, as I told, uh, for 15 years probably, uh, traveling uh, uh, closer to the border, uh, tens of the small, uh, towns uh, or villages with some small groups of intelligentsia trying to organize uh, something uh, 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 on, on the civil uh, civic sector that people would be themselves involved in doing that and uh, doing or or uh, collecting uh, memoirs or or or, or uh, inviting the neighbors yeah they they are uh, very pleased when you come with the lecture. <laughs> but I say, but you know more than me. You are inviting me to, to tell you about you. <laughs> and uh, it's still very, very um, uh, uh, painfully signed by, 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 the, by the feature some scholars uh, would say post-Soviet, post-colonial. <laughs> and uh, and the, the, this challenge to, 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 to invite people to, to believe in uh, their own uh, memories, own, uh, own, own ability to orientate themselves, to, 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 to speak, to tell, to participate. And in this field, uh, my, my, my uh, perception of the result is like a failure. But you know, uh, I understand the Krzysztof's challenge. I still believe. I still believe in the sense what we are doing. Yeah. Thank you so much. But with, with these speakers, we, what we can only believe, my goodness, that yeah, that's, that's, there's no doubt about that. Look, we're, we're, um, we're, running, we're running out of time and I'm very aware that no one else has had a chance to ask a question yet. So, so, so please, th this, uh, this is the moment to, to um, ask, ask any questions that you may have. So again, Put, put a question in the chat if you I feel like I'm teaching a class now online put a question in the chat or good teacher or thank you <laughs> <laughs> David have you got a question no I was just politely putting my camera back up <laughs> <laughs> you, you heard the teacher getting a little bit I think yeah because the teacher is getting cross that we've, that we've not had a question I, I might have a question but I'm going to let others go first Is that a Friday afternoon silence there, I, I sense? I, I don't mind saying something, Nina. I can just, <laughs> I've been, you, David. I had my camera off because I was frantically taking notes rather than looking at the screen. And uh, I'd just like to thank all the speakers because I, you know, despite the fact that I'm sort of, a couple of the projects that were discussed, I was sort of aware, uh, had some knowledge of them already. Uh, but hearing them discussed in the same uh, space 
has been really enlightening. And uh, I want to come back to that idea of space because I was very interested in what Luzina was saying, and it, which connected with what the other speakers were saying about um, how certain kinds of practice can create a space but that that so we're getting abstract here uh, that that space is is kind of very located so you've got a historical place if you like which is kind of freighted with all of these different histories and what i was quite taken with was the idea expressed in different ways by um the speakers that you can create certain kinds of cultural practice that can bring a group of people together. It might be a local community, it might be a temporary group of people. And it's through that practice, that shared practice, that a new space opens up for a different kind of imagining of the historical place. So I realize that's not a, a question, that's more of a, a summary, but I would, I'd be interested to hear if the speakers think I've got that right, whether that is a fair summary of, of a lot of the things that they've been talking about. Um, well, I think it's a very good summary because, yes, you create space and it's not only about physical space per se, which, which basically is the center of today's discussion, but it could be a shared memory of something which enlarges the spaces we share. Like it could be that we are not physically in the same place, but through shared memories, um, related to a space in this context somehow, even through a practice that was once practiced somewhere and we have kind of recreated it, we create this common space. The problem I see is that uh, to me, there is more and more shrinking spaces in terms of not only these physical spaces that are lost or are not uh, uh, physically located uh, in a territory of one uh, state or in another state or whatever. And it's not only about these physical spaces, but it's about more and more shrinking virtual spaces for such conversations of about common memory. And I don't know whether I'm clear um, in what I'm trying to say, but that's, that's the trend I see. And it's more and more, uh, again, not creating, the, the world is becoming a place where you don't create shared spaces or the, the shared spaces are shrinking. And then you see, new violence and new, I don't know, um, different differentiating and again, splitting people more rather than creating this possibility for a shared memory about a shared physical or what so, whatever space. So the, that's the trend I see and I think that it is a challenge because uh, as, as much as our common, common whatever is based on memories we have. Um, uh, when we start, when, when we start, um, when the mainstream narrative, top-down narrative of state intervenes into this space and creates more conflicting spaces, and conflicting memories, it becomes uh, less and less possible to do projects that would encourage people to think and create these common discourses and common narratives around a physical or metaphysical or uh, whatever space it could be. Thank you, Lucina. Any other thoughts on David's, David's question, David's thought? I think you are right, David, so this is very much about the space. Uh, I would add only um, to what Elu said that, uh, of course, you, you, there is a power of heritage with spaces. You possessed some spaces from the past, places, monuments, buildings. And the question is what to do with this heritage. One answer is build museum, reconstruct, 
memorialized uh, of this uh, to keep the past. Uh, mm, our answer to that would be a, a little bit different, not uh, how to find a way not to create museum, but a cultural living center in in the spaces like synagogue or menor house of Czesław Miłosz family, you know, the, uh, uh, which was our challenge. Uh, so the question we face from the beginning is, if not the museum, that what? Yes, if not the Jewish museum in the synagogue, then what? If not the Czesław Miłosz museum in, in the manor house uh, in Krasnogruda, then what? And, and this, is, this opens up uh, the quite uh, uh, challenging uh, perspective, you know, that uh, to find the, this balance between continuing from the past, you know, finding the way of continuing, which mean, continuing also means overcoming, uh, um, not only preserving uh, or uh, celebrating, but overcoming. And also being open for new, you know, having it as a laboratory of the future of, you know, having courage to uh, to create new things with the space, with the places. So that's, I think, the main aporia I see, especially in Central Eastern Europe, but maybe not only we are overwhelmed by this heritage uh, of the past and and our cultural budgets uh, are mostly overwhelmed, you know, overloaded with uh, with money spending for keeping these uh, uh, places, you, you know, like museum or commemorative monuments, but with a very little space for laboratories of the new, with a very little space for avant-garde things for rioting, you know, creating revolutionary things, which is somehow, it is interesting, but it's so, uh, somehow against the heritage, you know, because at least what we have with Miłosz, you know, or it was quite rioting heritage of, of what was in the past to create new things, to, uh, to, um, uh, to find new language, uh, for uh, for um, touching the reality because we and maybe this is uh, the second thing I would add you, uh, that as much as the space the locality for us also the challenge is to create a language you know like this um, laboratory of language of creating not only space but the language for narrative. Uh, 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 you want to to build in, in that spaces. It goes together. If you do not have language, if you have problems with that, if something is unspeakable or tabooized, uh, then the space doesn't work. You know, the space getting older and dead. Um, in fact, so the the language is something like a virus. When you catch the new words or catch the words which opens up the new horizons or things breaking, you know, prejudices or these uh, uh, from the past, it it gives you the opportunity to create a new skeleton of the space, you know, of, of new constructions, of new use for the uh, for that. You need this um, uh, uh, this support um, uh, along uh, along um, the spaces you possess. So it became from very beginning uh, uh, for us, you know, the obvious if we will not create a narrative to these places, uh, in, say, you know, uh, Krasnogruda, if we will not have uh, the language for that, it will not be possible to go on with the borderland somehow. Mm. Have we got anything to add to that? No, uh, maybe instead of my uh, input to the conclusion, I would say, let's go to read Simon Sharma. Uh, landscape and memory. <laughs> Two uh, important uh, stones, fundamental stones for the spatial imagination and uh, uh, some vital uh, 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 life, uh, life and future. Landscape and memory. 
course, in the introduction of, of this wonderful uh, book, he just uh, uh, described the space from Punsk, uh, Poland, to Lithuanian side, the space where uh, even the gravestones were burned. I mean, uh, and probably uh, if we look for, for something good in the future, we need to resist that fatal, uh, fatalistic, this fate or, or that we can say that is, this is the space where the Jews were exterminated. Mm -hmm. Only one feature and so dramatic, mm -hmm. bloody negative, which uh, makes the space one. Uh, across the borders and uh, so what and and uh, then memory when we restore that when the, in our memories when we uh, resettle the space with the people we are still uh, concerned about Those Jews uh, the Poles or Lithuanians uh, different sides of the border or the Germans disappeared Germans but 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 uh, only memory makes uh, the landscape uh, our uh, native space. Thank you so much. I think Sharma will appreciate the plug for his book there in, 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 in the final <laughs> sentences. Look, I'm I'm going unless there are any burning um, questions, which I sense there aren't, or any final thoughts. I'm going to just, well, thank our three um, speakers. Well, it's a huge thank you to all three of you for being so generous with your time, being so generous with your, your thoughts on this subject. It's been such a such a rich, enlightening um, conversation. And the the yeah, yeah, the yeah, it makes me want to repeat these on a monthly basis to see where we go with them and then to create that 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 institute that's needed on the Lithuanian side of the border there. So um yeah, there's the, lots of work left to do, but yeah, huge thank you to all, you all. So yeah, have a have a good Friday evening, have a good weekend, everybody, and huge thank you. Have a nice thank you. Thank, thank you, you bye everybody bye. for staying. Thank, thank you, you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.